It's been a minute since I did a 50s movie on this show, but this time I think I'll change things up a little bit. So far, I've mostly concentrated on monster flicks from the 50s, so now I'm gonna do an alien invasion movie. And what better way to start than with a movie based off the granddaddy of all alien invader stories, War of the Worlds. <laughs> H.G. Wells' novel The War of the Worlds is one of the most important in science fiction. The whole alien invader genre is so common now that it's taken for granted, but this was one of the first stories to depict a full-scale invasion of Earth by beings from another planet. Attempts at a movie adaptation were thought of as far back as the silent era, and there was the famous 1938 Orson Welles radio broadcast that some people reportedly thought was real. But it wasn't until the science fiction boom of the 1950s that a big screen version finally happened. This one comes to us courtesy of producer George Pal, who specialized in other sci-fi spectacles like Destination Moon, When Worlds Collide, Conquest of Space, and The Time Machine. George Powell's movies were big, they were colorful, and they tried to be at least a little bit scientifically accurate, even if the science is dated by today's standards. But War of the Worlds is considered by many to not only be his best film, but also one of the best sci-fi movies of the 1950s. I am still gonna make smart-ass comments throughout it, though. Wait, what the hell? Black and white? I thought this movie was in color. The Second World War involved every continent on the globe, and men turned to science for new devices of warfare. Yeah, real nice that they included the newsreel at the beginning, but could we get to the actual movie? I'm a little surprised they didn't also have a cartoon at the beginning. After all, one of George Powell's previous movies, Destination Moon, featured an appearance by Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> I guess it's appropriate they're including all this stock footage since the opening credits are in World War II military font. Whoa, Barry Lyndon? Oh, this promises to be a beautifully shot but somewhat tedious Kubrick movie. So, like any good 50s sci-fi movie, we begin with some opening narration. I mean, more opening narration. This time courtesy of Sir Cedric Hardwick telling us about the planet Mars. Mars is more than 140 million miles from the sun. At night, temperatures drop far below zero, even at its equator. Uh, whatever. I live in Saskatchewan. Suck it up and put on a parka, you Martian pussies. Because Mars sucks, the inhabitants decide to colonize another planet. They could not go to Pluto, outermost of all planets. They couldn't go to Neptune or Uranus. Yeah, you don't want to go to Uranus. That place stinks. Aw, <laughs> uh, come on. I had to. I had to. By the way, this movie actually had a pretty big budget for when it was made, and we see that right away with these matte paintings. Yeah, they might not be realistic exactly, they look more like they're from an animated movie, but they are still pretty cool. After the narration, the real movie begins when a comet lands near the sleepy California town of 50sville. Boy, that have Wonder where it lit. Out the way, I bet you. Hey, let's go find it, huh? Come on, fellas, you better get out there. The blob's not gonna discover itself. Now, the fact that the movie changed the setting from 1800s England to 1950s California caused some controversy, but I get why they did it. When the book was written, Britain was the world's superpower, and the story was about what would happen if they were attacked by a technologically superior enemy that they were helpless against. But by the 50s, the US was number one, so it made sense that they changed it. Plus, you know, American audiences in 1953 probably didn't want to sit through an entire movie of British accents. And because it's the 50s, that means every car has to look like if the Griswolds were bank robbers. Looks like the fishing was good. Have some. Well, I might just do that. Huh. This fat guy cop looks like his first and last names are both Barney. Right? No, I'll smoke it later. Ah, come on. It's the 50s. Nine out of ten doctors say you should smoke it now. Well, there's a giant meteorite in California. What are they going to do with such an amazing discovery? They won't be able to haul this one away to no museum. It'll be a real good attraction for Sunday drivers. Hey, good thinking. Dress it up like the world's biggest ball of string and it'll pay for itself in no time. Man, everyone's coming to see this thing. I don't understand why a meteor that size didn't make a bigger crater. Yeah, yeah, just change into Superman and throw it back into space, okay? Uh, but wait. Some scientists want to look at it first. But the ranger said a scientist is coming from Pacific Tech. Clayton Forrester, ever hear of him? Hell yeah, I've heard of him. He's half the reason I'm even doing this video right now. And this guy's also heard of him because he's Dr. Forrester. Well, I might have recognized you without the beard, and 
You didn't wear glasses on the time cover. Wait, she didn't recognize him because he's wearing glasses? Is this guy actually Superman? And don't go whacking this thing just yet. First, they got to make sure it's safe. This is a Geiger counter for detecting radioactivity. Look at this thing, it's going crazy. Eh, I'm sure it's fine. They're shooting a movie with John Wayne out here later. Well, that's enough science for one day. Now, what is there to do in this town? What do people do around here on a Saturday? Oh, they don't do much of anything. There's a square dance at the social hall this evening. Whoa, 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 square dance? That's awfully sinful, don't you think? I mean, look, I can practically see these girls' ankles. Fucking whores. Okay, enough dancing. Now time to get shit-faced on cola. Meanwhile, some townsfolk investigate the meteorite and... Hey, wait a second. I think there might be aliens in there. Where'd you think they come from? It's a 50s movie, so... Mars. Huh, actually, I think they might come from the planet of the phallic symbols. And don't make first contact with it. You don't know what they're gonna do with that thing. Come on out! We're friends! Hey, that's right! We welcome you! We're friends! Yeah! <laughs> Ooh, sorry fellas, but on Mars a white flag is the symbol for suck my balls. No wonder they were pissed. Well, great. The Martians just killed some people and ruined the church fondue party. The police better go investigate. Power lines are down. That explains why the lights went out. Nice work, Chief. On the plus side, the Martians made chalk outlines of the guys they killed, so that ought to save you some time. By the way, before we go on, I gotta mention the sound effects in this movie, because they are awesome. Just listen to the sound the ship and heat ray make here. Yeah, it's so 50s, but so distinctive. In fact, a lot of the sounds here would become stock sci-fi effects for years afterwards. Even more bad news, not only are the aliens hostile, but there's more of them. Oh, and here's Professor McPherson of the Canadian Meteorological Research Council. Is it true, Professor, you've had reports of landings in other places, in uh, Canada? Oh, fuck yeah, bud. They're landing all over the place. I wish they'd just take off and go back to Mars, eh? This reporter better be careful. The last time somebody broadcast a Martian invasion, it caused a real panic. Pilot has just lift his motor. That means he's dropped the flare. When it does burst, we shall be the first men on Earth to get a real look at these invaders from space. Don't you mean invaders from Mars? Oh, wait, that's a different 50s movie. And no need for the flare. The Martians will light up the night sky by setting everything on fire. Pretty soon the military moves in, and thankfully they remember to bring enough coffee and donuts to take on the Martians. The army is led by a guy called General Mann, and because this is a 50s movie, I'm assuming his first name is Real. Any news from abroad? Washington is in constant touch with the military of other nations. Apparently, they're coming down all over. Ah, yes. Back when every military commander had to have a 50s radio voice. Damn, even the way the general drinks his coffee is dramatic. Usually in 50s sci-fi flicks, you have to wait until over the halfway point to actually get a good look at the monster or aliens. But not in this movie. The Martian war machines make a full appearance at the 30-minute mark. Is that some kind of a flying machine? Oh, yeah. This is another important difference between the movie and the novel. In the book, the Martians use huge three-legged walking machines, which is the design the 2005 Steven Spielberg adaptation went with, but because that would have been hard to do from an effects standpoint in 1953, here they use flying manta ray type ships. Of course, they still kind of reference the machines from the book here. Supported from the ground by rays, probably some form of magnetic flux like invisible legs. Yeah, nice try, fellas, but these things still ain't tripods. Colonel, shooting's no good. Shouldn't you try to communicate with them first? No, 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 no. Better to start shooting. For all we know, they could be a bunch of dirty commies. I mean, Mars is the red planet, after all. There's only one thing that can save the Earth now, and that's a big old dose of Jesus. If they're more advanced than us, they should be nearer the Creator for that reason. The priest goes out to try and communicate with the Martians, and this goes about as well as you'd expect. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Yeah, no dice, Father. These aliens are Scientologists. Xenu sends his regards, motherfucker. Well, that does it. Let him have it, fellas. Can't get through to them. They put out some sort of electromagnetic covering. Another change from the book, the Martian ships have force fields here, which kind of makes me wonder if Roland Emmerich was a fan of this movie. Oh well, let's listen to more of those sound effects. They almost sound like if 50s ray gun and spaceship toys were attacking people. And by the way, I mean that as a compliment. It also might seem a little tame today, but in 1953, the level of destruction on display here was some of the most intense any sci-fi movie had shown at that point. <laughs> 
Jesus, sure hope that stuntman was okay. I checked IMDB, he was not okay. Dr. Forrester, get out of here! Everybody out of here! While the army's retreating, Dr. Forrester and Sylvia decide to take a plane for some reason instead of going with them, but I'm sure they'll be okay. <coughs> hey, sorry about that, sweetheart, but I'm a scientist, not a pilot. With the Martians attacking all over the world, General Mann isn't really sure what to do. Les Tremaine wasn't used to dealing with Martians yet. We heard that Dr. Clayton Forrester was out there with you. What's he think about this? Ah, uh, don't you worry, pal. There's a term for the kind of pain Dr. Forrester's gonna inflict on the Martians. Deep hurting. Deep hurting. But first he's gotta figure out how the hell he's gonna get out of here. Uh, what is he gonna do to her? Oh, there's your answer. He's getting her to cook eggs for him. Well, just because you're on the run from hostile alien invaders doesn't mean there's no time for breakfast. It is the most important meal of the day, after all. So, now that they're chilling here for a little bit, how about a little character development? I have no close folks. My parents died when I was a kid. They died after my home planet Krypton exploded. Better not get too comfortable. I think the bug from Men in Black just landed. Oh, wait, it's the Martians. There's a machine standing right alongside of us. Quit acting like these things have legs. They are clearly flying. And if you thought the Martians have been a little too intimidating so far, they send in a probe that looks like a cute robot. Hiya. All right, I joke, but this probe was actually pretty innovative for the time, and it did have a big influence on later sci-fi movies. We also see one of the Martians at this point, and much like the probe, it's weird, but also strangely adorable. Now, in the book, the Martians are described as tentacled blob creatures, but that would have been hard to do in 1953. Not impossible, though. None other than legendary stop-motion animator Ray Harryhausen attempted to make a movie adaptation using that design, creating concept art and even some test footage that you can still find on the internet. Some even say that Harryhausen was the one who convinced George Powell to do a film adaptation, but when he actually got around to making it, Harryhausen wasn't involved. Well, too bad Harryhausen wasn't involved. He could have given us Martians that looked like they did in the book and animated the tripods, but the results here aren't bad. I appreciate that they didn't just go with a guy with pointy ears painted green or something and actually tried to make the Martians look weird and alien here, even if they sometimes look like E.T. with his head cut off running around like a chicken. You know, in hindsight, maybe we should have just had some cereal and got the hell out of here instead of cooking eggs. <laughs> Anyway, while the Martians are busy laying waste to stock footage from all over the world, the military is busy playing a giant game of Risk. Montreal's blacked out. Nothing more has come through. Well, gentlemen, if Moose Jaw falls, that means the Earth is doomed. Well, okay, there is one more thing they can try against the Martians. The White House will confirm an order to use the atom bomb. Yeah, that's right. They're gonna drop a nuke on the Martians with a... flying... Boomerang, which was probably pretty impressive in the 50s. We've been warned that this bomb is ten times more powerful than anything previously used. Nothing like this has ever been exploded before, and we're gonna be pretty darn close. Well, that doesn't sound very safe. Not that it matters, people are watching like it's Woodstock. No worries, though. See, they're wearing raincoats, they'll be fine. They drop the A-bomb on the Martians, and I gotta say, this part where they're trying to find out if it worked, only to see the ships emerge from the smoke, is also very similar to a scene in Independence Day. Okay, I take back my comment about wondering whether or not Roland Emmerich was a fan of this movie, because I think he definitely was. Well, looks like the Earth is doomed and the population is descending into panic and looting, but on the plus side, this kid got some ice cream. Might as well steal some beer while you're at it. Everybody else is looting. Get up, buster! Of course, it is still the 50s, which means that even at the end of the world, people still say buster. Damn, not only does Dr. Forrester lose his glasses, but there also aren't any phone booths around for him to change in. While this is going on, the Martians start to lay waste to Los Angeles, and it's a shame this movie wasn't made today. I'd really love it if they blew up an influencer house. Oh, and did I mention this movie was probably an influence on Independence Day? <laughs> While looking for Sylvia, Dr. Forrester goes into a church. Better hope Jesus put you on the guest list for heaven. Oh Lord, we pray thee, grant us the miracle of thy divine 
intervention. Please do us all a favor and righteously smite some Martian ass. Oh, and speaking of divine, I know this is a minor detail, but why does it look like Jesus is wearing drag queen makeup in this statue? I know I've already mentioned this, but the level of destruction shown here was on a level that had rarely been shown in sci-fi movies before. At the time, this was one of the most apocalyptic sci-fi flicks anybody had ever seen. Usually in these types of movies, the main scientist will whip up some sort of invention that'll defeat the aliens, but here, you really get the the feeling that humanity's fucked. The only thing they can do now is pray that their death is swift. Now, the ending to the novel War of the Worlds is pretty well known at this point, but in case you don't know, the Martians are defeated by... germs. That's right, instead of weapons, the Martians are taken down by common diseases that humans have become immune to. No, I forgot to wash my hands after using the bathroom. My one weakness. Okay, that's one difference between this and Independence Day. The aliens there weren't defeated by a virus. I gave it a virus. Computer virus. Oh, wait, never mind. Actually, they were. Well, thanks, Dr. Forrester. I mean... You didn't really do anything, but you said some science-y stuff earlier, so, you know, thanks for that. One last difference in the movie from the book is that there's more religious overtones here, but again, 50s. Despite its many departures from the book, H.G. Wells' estate was reportedly so pleased with the movie that they gave George Powell the rights to adapt another of Wells' stories, The Time Machine, which he did in 1960. It also got a release from the Criterion Collection, which puts it on the same level as Armageddon. There was even a War of the Worlds TV series in the late 80s that directly followed and referenced this version. And while it may not be as influential as the book, this still had a big impact on sci-fi movies. Yeah, sure, like any 50s movie, parts of it are going to be dated, and the characters are mostly stock archetypes like the heroic scientist, the gung-ho general, and the female love interest who's mostly there to just scream and cook eggs. But make no mistake, this movie still has an important place in science fiction history. While it wasn't the first Alien Invader movie, this really helped popularize the genre. And like I said, its scenes of destruction would end up being a huge influence on future sci-fi flicks. So just like how science fiction as a whole wouldn't be the same without the novel, sci-fi movies wouldn't be the same without George Pal's War of the Worlds. So there you go, I actually did an important movie on this channel. Don't get used to it, though. Next episode, I'm probably going to do a movie about TV zombies or something. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. Everybody out of here! Everybody out!